Okay, so I will try to make this somewhat quick, especially because I always like to have a guest speaker talk about something related to our service learning, whether it's Malama Kuloa or um, someone talking about traditional ecological knowledge and the power of observation. But I do want to talk to you a little bit about service learning and why we do it, right? So we, ha we have several reasons for service learning, but like I said, my main goal for you to get out of this class is something practical. I want you to be able to take what we've learned in this class and take it with you in your life, whether it's making informed decisions about your health, whether you're getting more active in your community, whether you understand that we need more local sustainable food systems, whatever it is, uh, whatever is important to you, whatever is your kuleana, I want you to take it with you. And service learning, I think, is a great way to do that. Um, it gets you out in nature a lot of times, discover your community, you get to give back to your community, and you get to relate all of these things. Um, and hopefully, hopefully while you're doing that, you are able to learn more about this place and where you are. And you get some Aina-based learning, you get more Ike Hawaii, you get more Nahona Hawaii, you get to maybe you learn some olelo, whatever it is, I hope that you get something really great out of this. Um, and obviously we have a few different options. This is one that we actually aren't doing at this moment because of COVID, um, but if you've ever been to Pearl Harbor National Wildlife Refuge, uh, the Kalai Loa unit, it's also a really special place. Um, it's right next to the Barber's Point um, uh, airfield or or airport, I guess, um, but it's, it's kind of right in between that and a chemical plant. So it's a really interesting place, um, and I think it's very telling of <laughs> who we are as a society, where we're placing conservation land. But it's a really neat area, so if you ever get to go out there, I highly encourage it. And it's just to tell you a little bit about the Eva Plain, which I think a lot of you live um live in the Eva, Eva Plain, which isn't just Eva, right? We're talking about Kapolei. We're talking basically from Pu'uloa, Pearl Harbor, all the way to Makakilo. Um, but it's limestone, it's old race coral reef, and places like Kalailoa contain the last remaining ancient coastal drive shrubland plant communities um, on the island, on some, sometimes all of the islands. So there's a lot of really cool species there, a lot of endemic native species that are really important. Um, endemic just means that it's found nowhere else in the world. So those are especially ones that we want to protect. Hawaii has a really high rate of endemism. Um, I think it's somewhere like 25 to 30 uh, percent of species found here are endemic. They're only found in Hawaii, nowhere else in the world. And that's that's really special, and I think that it's really easy to overlook, but that's something that's really, really important um, and really a really cool story from Hawaii of what diversity we have here. Um, so at Kalailoa, if you ever do get a chance to volunteer there, if you're ever wondering about it, um, they do have lots of different plants of a hinahina, a koko. Um, Nayo is one of the, the big ones there, uh, predominantly Nayo there, but they do have an issue with thrips on other areas um, of the islands, and they're basically just a pest, and you can tell the difference between the infested and the healthy here. So one of the things they're trying to do at Kalailoa is protect, protect these, and they're basically removing invasives and planting out natives in hopes that you know, we can get more and more, basically. Um, another cool thing that's at Kalilo, if you ever do get a chance to go, I just think that this place is so special. I like talking about it, but they have the ankyline pools. Um, these are land -like, landlocked body of water with a subterranean connection to the ocean. So it's a connection that you can't see, but we know that they are actually, um, they are actually connected. These ones were artificially created here, and shrimp actually showed up. So these are little opai ula, um, if you've heard about them. Uh, there's tons of different species, like hundreds, I think. Um, most of them are endemic. Um, and we have tons of these. Like when you go look at these pools, you'll actually see like layers of red. And those are the opai ula. So they do um, like shrimp counts and cool stuff like that. Um, or even just going to see it if you do ever get a chance to go out there. Um, it's also one of the places that it's really clear to see how climate change can affect it. And if you ever work with them, 
you'll see that they're planning ahead for that. So they're planning ahead for sea level rise. So they're not planting anything near the ocean. They're planting pretty far back um, because they're, they're planning ahead for what it's gonna look like in 20 years and 100 years and really trying to make sure that we preserve all the native plants that are there. Um, there's also a place called Kaliloa Heritage Park where you can work with Uncle Shad. Um, and a lot of the times he doesn't even have you work. He just talks to you, which is also really fun and really a treat. So if you do ever get a chance to go there as well, um, very similar fauna, a lot of native out planting and invasive pulling of species, um, lots of cultural references here as well. It's a very, very special place. Um, Malama Pu'uloa is another one, and this is one that you'll probably hear more about um, in class, but Malama Pu'uloa, Pu'uloa is Pearl Harbor. Uh, Malama Pu'uloa has an overall mission, I would say, of restoring um, the waters of Pu'uloa to what they were before the military and before our population really grew. Um, and you know, with the ultimate goal of restoring it and also recovering our Hawaiian food systems that used to exist here. There are several fish ponds here. Um, there's more fish ponds that they're working on. This is actually a photo. Um, it's bordering a golf course and Auntie Sandy, who is in charge of Moama Pu'uloa has the ultimate goal of getting this golf course to give up their land and um, create more or grow more local food there. And I think that that's awesome and I will 100% support it. We've got enough golf courses. But um, some of the main takeaways um, in reflection and when you're going through your Kuleana paper, um, you know, native versus invasive species in some of these places, climate change. Um, you also have cultural implications as well. Just please make sure that you kind of relate them to the biological concepts, like talking about restoring our food systems to what they were once. And, you know, obviously that's, that's really important here for a lot of reasons, but cultural reasons are definitely one of them as well. And hopefully you'll, you'll learn more of that as you start going through um, some of these opportunities, especially if you go to the in-person ones. So I did want to talk to you a little bit about um, marine debris because you're not necessarily going to get this from the book, but it's something that's close to my heart. And since one of your options is to do a beach cleanup, whether it's with an organized group like Sustainable Coastlines or Surf Rider Foundation or by yourself or with family, friends, whatever it might be, I think it's important that you do know a little bit about it. Um, so everyone has probably heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch by now. Um, and yeah, it's a real thing. Yeah, it's a problem. Um, <laughs> like it's it's huge. Um, and it's not like you're gonna go up um to this area and just find this huge patch of garbage. Like you're just gonna see garbage everywhere. Um, and and that's really what it is. And it it's very big. And a big part of the reason why it exists up here is you because you have this whole convergence zone. So this is where a lot of the um currents are basically taking all this trash to. This trash isn't just from the US, it's not just from Asia, it's, it's from all over the world. Um, and it's pretty wild what you can find in different parts of the world, what will wash up in different places. Okay, so again, um, this is actually just north of us. So you can see us um, down here. This is here, um, I mean, pretty far north of us, if you're looking at the grand scale of things, that's closer in line with like California um, and upper west coast, even getting into Oregon. Um, but up above us, if you don't know, we have the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Okay, and the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands are uninhabited. They're beautiful, special places um, and very important culturally here. If, if you don't know, um, they're also really important. Uh, there's quite a high level of endemism, diversity. It, it, it's a really special place. And I've been lucky enough to been able to go a couple of times. One of them was on a marine debris mission. And because the North Pacific Garbage Patch is north of us, the Northwestern Islands, um, Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, excuse me, are acting as sort of a kind of a catch-all for things that are coming down towards the main Hawaiian Islands. So even though there's no humans living up here, there's a crazy amount of trash that gets here. Um, this is, I'm just going to show you a little bit about these assholes um, and these islands if you haven't 
haven't seen them before. This is, I'm actually on this boat. We're heading to the ship. Um, and this is leaving one of the reefs up in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So these are what the reefs look like. They're all kind of barrier reefs. Um, and then sometimes there's an island, sometimes there's not, sometimes it's more of an atoll. Um, but you can see here's our little boat. We're pulled up to this reef and we're pulled here because of this big thing here. Does anyone know what that is? Obviously not meant to be there and it's hard to see. So what we do is we jump in the water and we just swim. <laughs> and we have the boat follow us and we put up our hand when we find something big. Um, you know, if we see little things floating in the water, obviously we get those. But another big part of plastic solution, actually a really significant part that is often not talked about are fishing nets. Fishing nets are a huge portion of plastic solution in the world. So we're going through here and mostly looking for fishing nets. So we do use drones too to kind of help us um, sometimes, but it normally it's just us swimming and looking for these things. And you can see I'm not on these boats, but these are just cool pictures taken from Midway Island um, or Midway Atoll. And we just fill up these boats with fishing nets. And these are what the atolls look like. So they're very, very flat. And so it's really easy for things to wash up on the beach. And there's lots of barrier reefs around these little atolls and islands. So all of these nets and things just get caught on the reef. Again, just more pictures. This is a, a, lot, of, a lot of photos in this slideshow. So what is marine debris? You guys probably know, um, and this is kind of more aimed at kids, but you know, this is debris that's on the beach, but it's natural. So we're not concerned about this. This isn't really what we would consider marine debris. Again, a coconut, not marine debris. This is where we're starting to get into marine debris. So this is trash, right? And this is something um, you hear about this often being mistaken by turtles for uh, jellyfish. And it's true. I mean, I, I've i put on little turtle, pretend turtle eyes on kids and had them try to differentiate, you know, looking at a plastic bag and how that would look very much like a jellyfish. So these are obviously a problem. Um, and there are things that you find everywhere, right? This is a pretty viral photo. Uh, I think this is in Indonesia, but I could be wrong, um, of someone surfing this wave. And obviously, there's a lot of natural debris here as well, but there's also quite a bit of trash. These are just some of the examples of how much stuff we pick up um, in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And this isn't unique to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, mind you, but I, I think that you find a lot of trash there um, because it's acting as, you know, kind of a barrier to the main Hawaiian Islands. And so you find a lot of this here too, believe me, but here it's both a mixture of local because you have humans inhabiting the islands and things that are coming from different parts of the world, right? We all, we all remember, um, or maybe we don't all remember, but the when that Japanese tsunami hit um, and we were getting stuff washed over here and everyone was worried about if it's radioactive or not. Um, but yeah, we do get a lot of things from Japan, but we get things from all over the world. Find lots of shoes, crazy amounts of shoes. Um, and then lots of like little toys and stuff like these little army men, which are honestly kind of fun to find. And I do keep them when I find these kind of things. But just remember, if it's plastic, if you've ever had anything plastic in your life, it still exists. It's still somewhere. Um, these are lights, right? This is a bottle probably full of oil. Little horse that we found underwater. This is an example. This came from London. So these things are not necessarily coming just from Hawaii. They're not coming from Asia. We can't put the blame on one, um, one community. It really is all over. Tires. These are on beaches that have had very few humans. No one is living there. Um, the only people visiting are there to do monk seal research or native bird research or to do marine debris to clean up. Okay, um, just more examples. And you can see, obviously, a lot of these things aren't whole. So this could be a bite from something. Um, it could have naturally happened. <laughs> this is a computer. Um, tons of toothbrushes. Tons and tons of toothbrushes. These are all lighters. 
Okay. These are all fishing supplies. Again, more nets. And one of the big problems with nets, especially, or any plastic solution, other than, you know, obviously we don't want trash everywhere, but it's terrible for all of our animals. And the one thing it has in common is they're all made of plastic. Even our fishing nets made of plastic. That's why they last forever. Okay. So how does it all get into our oceans? It's not simply by people just throwing it in. Um, I think that's a common misconception. We look at the ocean and we're like, oh my gosh, why is everyone littering? But that's not it, right? We we do litter and that's terrible. And we want to we want to get away from that, obviously. But plastic is also getting into our oceans just from landfills. It does sometimes things don't make it to the landfill, and like we we talked about before with groundwater and um, water runoff when it rains, anything on the land after a big rain is going straight to the sea. In our case, and in in a lot of places, even in landlocked places, you can have stuff in Minnesota that's going to make its way into the lake, um, that's going to make its way somewhere. Again, plastic never disappears. This stuff doesn't break down. It takes hundreds and hundreds of years. So if you've used something plastic in your lifetime, it still exists. Um, and this, keep in mind, this lecture isn't to completely guilt you <laughs> into feeling terrible about all this plastic, but it is hopefully to make you a little bit mindful of all these things that are happening and to really think about if you do choose to do something like a beach cleanup for your service learning, what it actually means and where these things are coming from. Um, and beach cleanups are great, but you know, they're kind of a band-aid. But we see plastics like this that aren't whole, so we wonder where did the rest of the plastic go, right? Um, but plastic goes into the ocean and all sorts of things. So it can break down naturally um, or degrade, you know, with the sun or something like that. But also we have plankton and small fish that are eating it. And those fish are getting eaten by bigger fish. And then who's eating the big fish? We are, right? Um, we also have other, other animals that are um, eating, you know, like we already talked about the turtles, but even like monk seals or sharks or larger marine animals that are getting entangled in these nets that are also being dropped into the ocean. Okay, so lots of ways that they're affecting marine life. These are albatross, and these poor albatross, they see these floating lighters in the ocean, and they think they're fish. They dive bomb, they eat them. They realize, oh, that wasn't fish, but they're super attracted to all these really colorful plastics, and it's a problem, um, and it's not their fault. This isn't something that they evolved to differentiate. It wasn't something that was natural. It's something that we've, we've done and we've introduced, right? Um, and albatross are one of the key species in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, and we, we see them even here, like at cut in a point. Um, so if you ever want to do a cleanup there, that's also a great place. And, you know, sometimes you see dead birds, this is a dead bird, Not, none, nothing was changed. We found this dead bird. Look at all the plastics that are in this bird. Is that why it died? I don't know. Probably, it probably led to its death. Um, and this is a really famous photo. If you've seen this um, bird here it was taken, dissected, and this was all of the plastic that was found in the bird. It's insane. Um, and, and again, it's a really common issue. A lot of animals are being entangled in these nets. We, we do find quite a few of them and we cut them out best we can if we do find them alive. Um, and you know, we, we do the best that we can handling them and taking them out. So obviously, if you see anything like that, you do what you can to to help. Um, but there there are a lot of times where it's really difficult, especially with like monk seals. They're really, really difficult to deal with. So it's even better if you can call NOAA um, or call call different organizations to help out with that. But there are times, obviously, where we find things where there's just no helping. Um, the nets have already taken down, uh, you know, it could be sharks, it could be lots of little tiny invertebrates. These are urchins in here. But these huge nets just create these big conglomerates. And again, it's not necessarily like fishermen are like, I'm throwing this net overboard, I'm done with it. A lot of them are lost on accident, most of them. 
Um, but we do find brand new nets that have fallen off the boat by accident or, you know, I'm sure no one ever purposely gets rid of it because that's super expensive. But these are a huge issue of plastic pollution. Um, and if you've seen something like Sea Spiracy, which uh, I have my comments about that documentary and is not an assigned documentary in this, but it is kind of an interesting documentary and it has some good points. Um, and it's not fully the picture. It is meant to be a little bit harsher on some of these fisheries, but it it does do a good job of at least informing the public that these issues exist. So if, if you have seen it, you can relate that a little bit. And if you haven't seen it, it might be something that's interesting. Um, and there is some marine debris that's kind of treasure to us, like glass balls, if you guys have ever seen glass balls. Um, but again, monk seals, out all of these large animals are really attracted to this because they don't know what it is. So they're very curious. They want to go in and see. You can see these monk seals sometimes use them as like a place to to chill. Um, they're like, oh, this big floating neck, I can just hang out and not have to swim. Um, they're not the brightest animals all the time, but we are the ones that got them into a place um, near extinction. We're, we're doing a lot better today, but still, this is the most endangered marine mammal, I think, in the world. Um, we only have, I think, around 1,400, 1,500 marine, um, I'm sorry, monk seals, and they're, they are endemic to Hawaii. They're only found here. So this is a really special animal that we're, we're trying so hard to protect. That's why it's such a big deal when you see that someone shoots a monk seal or you find a dead one um, because we we drove them kind of like bison right uh we we drove them to the edge of extinction and now we're really doing our best to to bring them back um to some extent but we're we're not doing a great job all the time <laughs> the other issue these nets have is they will get caught on these barrier reefs and you can see this is coral right um we we know what coral bleaching is it's not good we can see this coral is probably not healthy either. It's smothered in algae, but this coral is completely dead. And it's because it's had this huge net laying on top of it that's blocked all the sunlight. It couldn't photosynthesize. Um, and so you have lots of corals being wrecked by this as well. This is just um, how we get our trash onto the boat and into the net, how we find it. We get to do tow boarding like this. Um, just to kind of show you what some work people are doing. I, I only did this one time. These are lots of pictures of other people doing it as well. But again, huge, huge nets that we find that are just like a massive amount of stuff that gets stuck all in one place um, because currents are kind of bringing it there. And this is just how we get it back onto the ship and then we bring it back here um, to Oahu or to Midway. This is on Midway Island. This is all of the trash that we found just on midway just on midway so it's a crazy amount of trash but once we bring it back here there's actually a really cool um, program called nets to energy from schnitzer steel and they take all of our nets they chop them all up um and then they actually convert it into energy which is really neat so what can you do to help obviously one of the reasons we're showing you this is because you can do something like a beach cleanup um and that that is really helpful that is something that is very useful. It keeps the marine debris from going back out into the ocean um, if possible. It also keeps it from um, getting to other animals. And then we can get a nice clean beach like this. Okay. And you can see all these little piles of trash that we have here. The other thing though that's really helpful, again, the beach cleanups are more like a band-aid. We really need to stop it at its source. And that means that we really need to stop using plastic. Um, so this comes down to an individual level to some extent. So do what you can if you're using reusable bags at the grocery store instead of, you know, now we've banned plastic bags here, um, thankfully, in my opinion. But, uh, you know, use reusable bags. Try to not eat at places with styrofoam containers. And if your favorite place has styrofoam containers, my favorite Thai place across the street uh, used to use all sorts of styrofoam, which now we're, we're making more laws against. Um, but they also had plastic cups and everything, and I kept bugging them, um, and uh, they would let me bring my own Tupperware that they would fill. Obviously, with COVID now, that's getting more difficult. Even when you go to, like, Dunkin' or Starbucks or something, it's hard to bring your own refillable cup. But these are all 
things that you can ask to do or push companies for better legislation um, and to kind of get to a point where we're using more reuse. So we've all heard of reduce, reuse, recycle. Obviously, that's great. Um, the best one is often refuse, right? So if someone's giving you something that you really don't need and it's plastic, refuse it. Don't use it. Um, if you don't need to use plastic utensils, then don't. Um, and again, luckily, Hawaii is really moving forward with this and creating a lot of laws that um, make it so that we can't have some of these plastics. But, you know, it's kind of a front. Um, they're still using a lot of plastics in different things. But that's, that's a little bit about marine debris and our plastic pollution issue. And again, it's not necessarily to make you feel bad. This is an individual problem. We have individual choices, um, but it, at, on a larger scale, this is really an issue that's systemic and it's coming from big companies and specifically big oil companies, right? Plastic is made from oil. Um, you'll hear about that more in climate change as well, but we're, it, it's not a whole, a whole it's, a terrible system and we came up with plastic in like the 50s and we we're so excited like oh my gosh this lasts forever and now we're like oh crap it lasts forever um so be mindful of your choices um if you're not already and we do do some things in this class to kind of you know have you do a trash audit or um calculate your ecological footprint your uh your carbon footprint and those are just to kind of make you aware. Um, what you choose to do with that is completely up to you. But again, we do have individual choices. It, it, it does rely heavier on larger companies and corporations that are creating this issue. The other um, reason to get you to do things like beach cleanups is to, to get you to see your environment and to see how it's changing. Um, to be an observer of your environment. That's something that we've had in the past too, um, is I've had someone come in and talk about using traditional ecological knowledge to kilo or to observe your environment. And that, that that's something you can see with things like coastal erosion too. Um, this is obviously an issue. Um, beach erosion is a huge issue here, especially in, in certain places, right? But beach erosion is removal of sand from a beach to a deeper water offshore um, or along shore into inlets, tidal shoals, bays. Um, but you see this kind of erosion in different places and it, it often comes after big storms or something like that. But it also happens from tsunamis or rising sea levels. So this is getting worse and worse with climate change. Um, is there a way to stop it? Yes. I mean, we can definitely try to slow down climate change. We can reduce our fossil fuel consumption um, and rising CO2 levels. Uh, you know, we can, tr we can try to do these things. And a lot of times what people try to do is they try to put up seawalls, jetties, um, things like that. But those are often actually even worse because what happens is once the seawater reaches that seawall, it bounces off with even more energy than it would have had if it just washed ashore. And so then it's actually taking out more sand than it normally would. So it's promoting even more beach loss. So this isn't really something that's a very great solution um, for the long term or even really for the short term. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, I. that's a little bit about things that I want you to experience in, in, in service learning, there is one last option to do a documentary. Well, not to do a documentary, but to watch a documentary. Um, so there's two documentaries that are out, uh, one called Kiss the Ground and one called Gather. They're both very similar. They're both really about regenerative agriculture at their heart. Um, Gather is more about food sovereignty um, and trying to restore food ecosystems that were once 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 there essentially and to kind of claim back that right to grow your food and um it, it has a lot more to do with indigenous communities um like native americans i think it's who it's really centered around um but regenerative agri agriculture as a whole is kind of coming back um and it's a more holistic approach to agriculture and it's focusing on the connections that you have between the ecosystem as a whole 
6K. So it's doing kind of more pre-modern farming techniques and working with natural systems using indigenous knowledge um, and really being a kilo to your environment and understanding what, what works best. Okay. So those are some of the options. Hopefully you learned some things and don't feel uh, too guilty, but make, make decisions based on what you know and what you think is clonal or um, right with, with what you can do. Um, again, plastics are, they're a hard thing to cut out. Everything has plastic. You look at shampoo um, and, and there's lots of different alternatives now. You can go to zero waste stores and get refills on some of these things, or you can use shampoo bars or you can make your own. Um, but it, it's still something we're always going to have plastic. I try to cut out as much as I can, but it, it still exists because it, it has to, because we, we aren't the ones that are making those decisions. So that's, if, if nothing else, um, think about these things and vote, vote for people that you think are making logical um, decisions that are going to benefit more than just our economy, that are going to benefit our home and our whole ecosystem as a whole, um, because that's really what we need moving forward.